Good morning class. I'm very happy to be here today in spite of these challenging COVID times, but uh, we have to try to make do with the best we can. So today I am assisted by two people and I'll first start by introducing myself. I'm Professor Faith Okalebo and I'm being assisted by your colleagues and classmates I'll allow them to introduce themselves. Yeah, good morning, I am Martin Omoha, your classmate. Good morning, I'm Rogan Mayura, classmate. Okay, so they'll be assisting me and, and I'm sure they'll be a very good assistance. Later on we'll be joined by Raphael, who, will, who is the expert in whatever we are doing. Now, our practical today is on bioanalytic methods. So first, I will start by defining what a bioanalytic method is. I taught you in class, and I, I will just repeat again for better clarification. So, a bioanalytic method is a method that is used to either detect or quantify the amount of drug in biological fluids. So, you find that when you take a drug, let's say like paracetamol, it will go into the body, it can go into the stomach, the blood, it can even be found in your hair. So you find that if you have been poisoned, somebody might need to know what drug this person took. That is now where bioanalytic methods come in. Now there are two types of bioanalytic methods. We have qualitative methods. These ones just detect. They tell you what type of drug the patient took. Then we have quantitative methods. These ones allow you to measure the amount of drug. There are very, very many types of bioanalytic methods and the major ones you will come across in practice are chromatographic methods and ELISA. In this practical, we are only focusing on chromatographic methods. Were you taught about chromatography? Yes. 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 So you have been talked about chromatography, so I will not go into the theory. Today we are only going to look at TLC. It doesn't stand for tender loving care. What does TLC stand for? Thin layer chromatography. Thin layer chromatography. Great. I can see that your colleagues have been reading and they know all their stuff, yeah? So that's what we are starting with today. So, chromatography is a method whereby a complex mixture is separated into its components by putting it on a stationary phase and separation is done by an eluent which is called the mobile phase. I would like to ask your colleague to give me the picture that is here next to him. I hope you can all see this picture. It's a very beautiful picture. Here we scanned a picture whereby we had 
a complex mixture at the baseline and it got separated into its components. So we shall see how this was done. Okay, so please return that. Okay, now which are the stationary faces that are used in column chromatography? So the stationary faces that are used are quite a number, yeah? Over here, we have the stationary phase that is most widely used. Can you read this? Silica gel. So this is silica gel. This is the most widely used stationary phase. And if you check properly, uh, we have different types of silica gel. We have silica gel for thin layer chromatography. On, you can see over here, please read for us the small text. <coughs> uh, for thin layer chromatography. Okay, so when you are buying silica gel, you should distinguish whether it is for thin layer chromatography or it is for column chromatography. Okay. So, silica gel comes in various sizes. Yeah? Okay, I want you to read over here. Silica gel 60. Silica gel 60 for preparative layer chromatography. Yeah, so he said this is for preparative thin layer chromatography. So when you are buying, you should be very sure to confirm what the use is for. Okay, we also have other types of stationary faces which you were taught about, such as aluminium oxide or cellulose, but those are not widely used. We will only use silica gel today. Now, in the first part of our practical, we are going to see how to make a TLC plate. As you can see, this is silica gel. It is actually a powder, yeah? It is actually a powder, yeah? So how do we make it appear like a paper where we can spot our materials? So you can have commercially available TLC plates that have already been made for you. Okay, so um, over here, this is a box, we purchased it. It has, it has about 20 TLC plates that have already been prepared for you. We also have, we have different suppliers. We have quite a number. Now, this is what the commercially available plate looks like. So I'd like to request your classmate to hold the edges and to lift the plate for you. So please turn, turn the plate. So you can see it looks like a paper. It looks like a paper. In fact, you might wonder now what is this, yeah? It looks like a paper. But actually you find that the silica gel has been immobilized on the plate, yeah? And we will see how to make the plate. So please turn it the other side. Can you see this metal surface? So the silica gel was immobilized on a sheet of aluminium. Yeah. 
So this is called an almil, al, aluminium backed plate. Yeah? So these are commercially available. Unfortunately, they are very, very expensive. So you can put it down. So when we are using this plate, and, no, on this side, please. So when you are using this plate, usually we cut them up. This is a used plate because if you use the whole plate, it is wasteful. You can actually take a scissors and cut it up. Um, I'd request that you bring me the scissors, please. So this is a piece that was cut. I can even go and cut it further. As you can see, so you can see the commercially available plates can be cut up. Okay. <clears throat> now in the next part of the practical, I will show you how to make a plate. Yeah. So in the lab, we make what we call glass backed plates because we need a piece of glass so this is simple ordinary glass yeah and you can use typically the size that we use is 20 centimeters by 20 centimeters i think you can see we don't have a ruler but this is 20 centimeters by 20 centimeters we can also use a microscope slide. These are the easiest to make. Now, if this is how you make, before you start making, you have to defat to remove oil from the plates. And today, did you apply any Vaseline before you came? Yes, yes or yes. you did, you did, yeah? Yes, yes. Now, I want you, if you touch this plate, what do you think will happen? You find that the Vaseline will stick on the, on the plate, yeah. So, which is very, very bad, because it will not allow a thin, even film to form. So, before you start anything, you take your plate, wash it with soap and water, then you dry with distilled water. Then the next step is very important. You have to defat the plate. And you defat it by taking cotton wool. Uh, you defat the plate by taking cotton wool. He will do it for us. Then you take an organic solvent, preferably acetone. So I I want you to pour acetone. Okay, this is chloroform, but we can also use acetone. I'll pour it over here, and then now you, you swab. Okay, so... You put it onto the cotton wool, and then now we swab the plate. Very, very clean. So he's doing a good job. You can see he's swabbing the plate. Can you see it's actually much cleaner? Yeah? Okay, you can, it's better to repeat it many times as possible. But we shall not do so because of, because of time considerations. So basically, the first step I said is that you defat the plate by wiping it very nicely with acetone. And you can see now the plate looks cleaner. Okay, we haven't swapped the other side, but you can see the plate looks cleaner. Now... After you have done that, you take your plates. Usually, you make more than, more than 
four plates at any given time. We have an apparatus, unfortunately it is not available with us today. And I would like to invite, invite Raphael to go through the Desaga equipment where we put the plates. So I, so I request Raphael to come here and to tell you about the Desaga equipment. So please uh, come here. Now we are in the preparation of the plates. So basically the first part is uh, cleaning the plate using acetone as uh, you have been explained earlier on. Now the next part you are supposed to have a series of plates placed together on a special machine known as the Saga e equipment. So the machine is not available now, but I will take you through what happens to using this machine. So first of all, you have your 20 by 20 plates. You, you are supposed to have several. So for this case, I will add another one, which has been uh, cleaned. Okay, so this one is also cleaned. So you make sure you, you do a good job. So after the drying, after the drying, the plates are placed in a horizontal manner like this. Okay. And they hold steadfastly on each of these ends. You can hold like this, hold here. So the plates are held like that. And thereafter, they're held using the Desaga equipment on the side. So this is how the equipment looks like. This is how the equipment looks like. So you can see this here. This here is the Desaga spreader, which is right here, which I'm holding. Okay. It has different thickness, and the, the edges here represent the equipment that hold the plates together. So once the plates are, are held steadfastly together, once the plates are held steadfastly together, the Desaga spreader here has got different kind of thicknesses. We've got one millimeter, 0 0.75 millimeters, 0 0.5 millimeter, and 0 0.25. So you shall be explained further the, 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 the uses of these uh, different kinds of uh, measurements. So before we do anything, once we have fastened our plates, we are supposed to prepare our slurry, and then after the preparation of the slurry, we are supposed to, using this spreader, to put the slurry here and spread all over. So as we get there, let us now prepare the slurry. So, so the, the slurry is prepared by weighing 35 grams of silica gel, which is already weighed. So this is the silica gel. In the, in, the, in, the, in the next few minutes, we shall be explained with what is the significance of this silica gel. So once we weigh 35 grams of silica gel, it is now put into such a glass container. It's called a shaker. So then 100 ml of distilled water are added. So we had already, because I've already marked where the 100 ml is, I'll just pour. So after that, you, you do like that, you cover, and then you're supposed to shake vigorously to obtain a uniform semi-solid semi slurry mixture. 
Okay? So you can look at it, you can shape. Okay. Thereafter, once it is ready, remember we had our 20, uh, our 20 by 20 plates together. So for purposes of this demonstration, the, these two will hold for me here. So we have a place there. Remember, according to the Desaga spreader, remember these edges are fastened, okay? They are fastened and held very well. So now, our spreader is usually placed on one end of the plate, okay? And then our slurry is put here at the center of the spreader. But now, the, the kind of plates you are making you'll have to adjust the thickness of the spreader. So if you are, doing, if you are making preparative plates, you'll use 1.0 mm. So the 1.0 mm is going to be on this side, and this is where you place your slurry in one motion. So once... To emphasize that point, I want him to read what is written over here. So please read at the bottom. Him to read. Yes. Read. 1.0 millimeter. Yes. So that is the thickness, the desired thickness of the slurry on the plate here. Yeah. So before you spread, make sure that you have the desired thickness. So when he's putting it over here, because we have different readings, he'll make sure that the one 0.0 millimeters is is now facing him like this then he puts it over here yes. yeah. so so the everything is ready our equipment is ready so now we are supposed to in one motion open our slurry and pour here okay so very quickly, uh, very quickly in one motion i will not pour because of course we have not fastened our equipment. Okay, hopefully next time we shall do it. But I suggest you can put very little yeah. and then just spread it as little as possible. When so, you spread. So now, you can have this one. So it's put in one motion like that. Just hold step first and then spread like this. Okay. After spreading, after spreading, you can see, just from, uh, just from this demonstration, you can see that after, when you spread, one of the plates is left with the slurry mixture there. So it is allowed to dry for about 30 minutes, and then it is unfastened, and the plates are removed. So you can see here, this is the wet slurry, and then it's going to dry. Yes. I don't know where you can see, but then please take a look. You can see this is wet slurry. Then you just leave it to, to air dry. Yeah. And then, uh, so over here, we have well prepared plates. You can see we have here well prepared plates where the slurry has dried. So over to you, Rafael. Okay. Uh, as we continue with the as we continue with the with the preparation, sorry, as we continue with the preparation, you can make uh, a preparative plate or an analytical plate. Maybe you can explain, Doctor, what did we mean by a preparative and an analytical plate? So before I explain, mm -hmm. I'll ask my dear student. What is a preparative plate? If you are not sure, you can ask him to tell you. Um, I, I don't know, maybe it's just something about preparation, but I'm not sure, I'm not really sure what is it is. Okay, yeah. so since he's not sure, I will explain what a preparative plate is and the other type of plate. Okay, now in TLC, we have two types of plates. Yeah? 
The first is a preparative plate. A preparative plate is made so that the slurry is very, very thick. So if you can see in the Desagas apparatus, this is the spreader, you find that we have, um, we have different thicknesses, like 1 ml, 0.75 ml, and the smallest is 0 0.2 millimeters. So a preparative plate is supposed to have very thick or very fat layer of silica gel. In this case, one millimeter. The reason being is that we need to recover the drug. For example, if he took, let's say, an overdose of paracetamol. On top of that, he also took food. Now, the food diluted the paracetamol in the stomach. Now, I need to recover the paracetamol. Yeah? So, what I do is that I have to take the contents of the stomach and then I put them on the TLC and then the components get separated. Mm. Then I detect where is my paracetamol. Then I scrape off that layer of silica gel to enable me to recover a high concentration of paracetamol. It is called preparative because it allows you to scrape off the part of interest and then you can recover the drug of interest by putting the silica gel that you have scraped off in some solvent. Now, the ordinary type of TLC just has a very, very thin layer. Extremely thin, like you can see over here. It is almost like a paper. So you find that you cannot put a heavy amount, you cannot put a heavy amount of your sample. And you cannot recover the drug of interest. You can only detect it, but it will not allow you to scrape off the silica gel so that you can recover the drug of interest. With preparative, you can load a lot of samples. Yeah? You can really load a lot of samples, and he will show you today we are using preparative. You can load a heavy amount, then you can. It will help you now to recover as much drug as possible. The semi-purified drug. So you find preparative is used for semi-purification. But then now ordinary TNC, you can only detect that. I suspect paracetamol is here, but you cannot recover or you cannot extract paracetamol from the biological sample. Yeah. Thank you so much. So now uh, you, can, you can tell the difference between a preparative and an analytical plate by the thickness. So as we progress, we will show you what happens. So the next stage, after it has dried for after, after your slurry has dried for 30 minutes, you can see it's already settling down. Yes. You can see it's settling down. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to activate it. So it is usually activated at a certain temperature in the oven. So it's activated at around 105 degrees in the oven. So 
so this is the dried meat. As you can see, Africa's dried it looks like this. You can see it has formed a layer. And then now you just put it in an oven. You have ovens around at 100 degrees centigrade. So the reason for putting it in the oven is that all the water will evaporate and it causes activation. Now it means that now the silica gel can bind very strongly to your sample. So it removes the water. For how long do you put it in the oven? One hour. One hour. So hmm? what you put here yeah. has given you the answer which is put in the oven for one hour. One hour. Yes. Okay. The preparation. The yes. yes. Yeah. Now we can assume that the plate has been activated. Now Mwalukumi and Raphael will show you how to spot the plate. So, so. Let us spot this one. Okay. So, uh, so Mwalukumbi has already Mwalukumbi has already done a preparative plate. So now this plate is ready. So now we need a raw material. A raw material in this case you shall use clove clove oh, oil. So this is clove oil. So for today we need we are going to find out. We want to we want to use this to spot. So this is a special kind of spotting technique. So there are different kinds of spotting techniques. So this method is called striking. And then there's another method of spotting. So for the preparative plate, we'll do we'll use the striking method. So let's look for a better plate to spot. Can we get a ruler? Yes. Just get a good one. Where is the ruler? The book. Give plate, yeah. And in a preparative plate, you should load as much of the sample as possible. But spotting or streaking, in this case, streaking, it's called streaking because we are going to pour a streak across so when you are spotting you should not spot from the bottom because we are going to put this plate in the tank yeah so we should spot some distance away from the bottom of the plate yeah? so you need a ruler typically you should spot at least two centimeters from the bottom of the plate. So what you do is that you take your ruler, you put two over here at the bottom. I will ask you to hold the ruler, please. Okay, please hold the ruler. Then at the edge, yeah. So you take Mark, now a, a sharp object like a slide. Yeah. And then now, because this one two is at the bottom, here I will roughly mark, just put a very light dot, which is, so here I'll mark two centimeters from the bottom. I do that also at various strategic points in the plate. So avoid touching it completely. So I put several dots. Then my streak should have a width of about one centimeter. centimeter. Yeah. So from where I put this dot, I measure one centimeter. So I need the ruler again. So 
the first dot is somewhere here. You don't have to be very accurate. So here I mark one centimeter from where I put the first dot. It, unless you are very near, it's not visible. But basically we are creating the boundaries for where we are going to strip. So let us repeat again. He had put another dot over here. So here I mark it again. And then I mark this one again. And at the edge I mark it again. So you should always avoid, okay, unfortunately he has made the plate very rough, but um, he, because he's uh, new at it, we can, we can put up with that. Always avoid touching the plate as far as possible. So what you saw was not really ideal practice, but it was just for demonstration. So basically what we are trying to do is that we are trying to demarcate boundaries where we are going to streak. Remember it should be at least, you should leave a space of two centimeters from the bottom and the streak should be one centimeter in width. Yes. Yeah. So we have demarcated our borders. Thank you. So to proceed now with the striking, our raw material is uh, it's called it's it's cloth. So here's our cloth. So here we are assuming that maybe this is a blood sample or maybe a very concentrated urine sample. We decided not to use a urine sample, um, but with what we decided here we are assuming that we are using a urine sample which we have concentrated and we want to check what drug is in the urine. So you take your sample then you take a pasture pipette. Ideally, the tip should be as thin as possible to avoid spreading too much material. So I will hold the plate while, or he can hold the plate while Raphael will demonstrate how to strip. So uh, our common rule is that you need to have a very stable base for doing that. So please face this side. For me to make it easier, is, is, are you seeing? Yes, okay. I can see. So now, the tri the trick is you 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 spot you you drop you you drop drop but you you connect the drops using the pasta pipette to make a streak. So I'll do one part. So I go to the demarcated zone. Yes. So you just, you just touch lightly. Yes. You can see this is our first spot. Just show them. You can lift it up. You can, you can see that's a, that is a clean spot. Uh, avoid starting also from the edges. So this part is the zone of demarcation. Okay. So you repeat that several times. So I want him to try, isn't it? Yes. Please try. Try and do it. So you just press. So make sure. No? Okay. 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 You move like that. Like that. And then you stop. That's it. So he has tried so much. So uh, now this is a. This plate, you, you, you allow it to dry. You give it some time to dry. So as it is drying, you need to prepare the mobile face where you are going to run this uh, urine sample for this case. Yeah. Okay, now I want to introduce the concept. I want to introduce the concept of a positive control and a negative control. If I suspect, let us say in this case, that Mwalukumbi took some, somebody decided to poison him and I suspect that he was poisoned with, let's say some, some pesticide, let us say an organophosphate. What I do is that I suspect he was poisoned with an organophosphate 
or even paracetamol. So the drug that I suspect he was poisoned with, I call it the positive control. So the drug I suspect he was poisoned with is called my, now my positive control. So what I do, in addition, let us say that now this trick over here is my, is my concentrated urine sample or the food sample. I take the drug that I suspect he was poisoned with. In this case, it could be an organophosphate. So I take my positive control. The glove is here. No, this is pure it, eugenol. Yes, eugenol, yeah. yeah. So I take, in addition, somewhere in the corner, but it should not be right at the end. It should always leave some space from the edge. About one centimeter. I make just a tiny spot. So I take now the, a pure, the pure drug and I spot it at the end. Because if the pure, if I can detect the pure drug in my sample, then it will confirm that he was poisoned with the organophosphate. Yeah. So whenever you're doing bioanalytic work, you need what we call the positive control. And it helps to confirm that that drug was present in your sample. Okay, so now you allow the spot to dry. Yes. Yeah, but now, in the next step, before now, actually, we are ready to do the analysis. Now, I want to tell you about the chromatographic tank. Yeah? So, uh, let me move here. So before you do analysis, usually first thing in the morning, if you know you're going to do analysis, the first thing you have to do is to prepare your chromatographic tank. So we have what we call chromatographic tanks. They come in different sizes. So here we can demonstrate three. Here we've demonstrated three. You can see that they vary in size. This is the largest tank. It can hold a plate whose size is 20 by 20 centimeters. So this is very, very large. Then we have various sizes. I've not put the whole range but you can see this one can hold a smaller plate and this one is designed to hold a microscope slide. So you simply, so to do the analysis, you simply put your plate into the tank. First you put your mobile face, then you put the, the glass plate or in this case it could be the aluminium backed plate into the tank and then you cover. Okay, I said when you're doing this analysis you should first prepare the tank and I said first thing in the morning. Why is that? The reason being is that you have to saturate the tank. What do you understand by the word saturation? Loudly. Loudly. It's the process by which the concentration is at the maximum level. The concentration is at the maximum level. Mm. So you must saturate the tank. With what? So you saturate it with the mobile face. So when you come in the morning, the first thing you do is that 
make sure the tank is very, very clean. In fact, the night before, wash the tank and defat it with acetone. acetone. I prefer to dry in the oven, although air drying will work. Now, when you have your clean tank, the first thing you do is that now in the morning when you come, is that you take a filter paper, take a filter paper. The reason being is that the filter paper aids in saturating the air in the tank. Yeah? And then you line the filter paper. You can see over here, we put a filter paper in the tank. So just cut a piece, then you make sure that all the walls are covered. So all we do is that we took the filter paper, cut it up into an appropriate size, and then we made sure that all the walls are covered. So we've done this also to this tank. But at least you have to leave one wall where you can see. Because if you cover everything, you will not be able to uh, see how the solvent is moving. So please take a look at the tank. Yeah. So you can see that all the wall is covered except this wall which allows us to see what is happening. Then, after you have done that, you take your mobile face. What is a mobile face? A mobile face, if you are using silica gel, most of the time you have to use an organic solvent. And they differ in polarity. We have many types of mobile faces. Before even you do the analysis, you have to identify the optimal mobile face that will cause separation. Sometimes you can put a mobile face and there is no separation. But that is a lecture for another time. So, so usually the most common mobile face that we use is dichloromethane. It is the least toxic and it is not volatile. You can use chloroform, but use of chloroform is discouraged because it can affect the liver. Yeah? You can use chloroform, then you can use what we call diethyl ether, which is, unfortunately is very volatile and it can explode, so it's not used much. So if you're working in the lab, avoid smoking because you can cause an explosion. We can also use methanol, but methanol is never used again alone because it is highly polar and it moves compounds very, very fast such that you cannot get good separation. Usually if you're using methanol, you mix it with dichloromethane. So when you're saturating the tank, you find that you take now your, now here you put your filter paper, now you take here your mobile face, in this case it is chloroform, and usually you measure, usually for this big tank, usually for the big tank I use 20 ml. Uh, for the small tank, you use a smaller amount, This one I'll use 10 ml. So, um, 10 ml. Eh? Okay. I'll add it. Assuming that's so 10 ml. So you power it. So, what can you see? What what can you see happening to the mobile face? Please tell us. The, the mobile face is moving upwards yeah. on the filter paper. Yeah. So it, what is happening is that the mobile face is climbing up on the 
filter paper. Do you remember in high school what we call this type of, of, of movement? What, what causes the movement? Capillarity. Capillary. The capillary. Yeah, so it's called capillary forces. Yeah? Mm. Now we want the air here to be totally saturated with the vapor of the mobile phase. So in order to do that, we must cover. So I wasted a lot of time because of explaining, but immediately you have put your mobile phase cover the chromatographic tank and you don't simply cover what you need to do is that you get silicone oil uh, it usually comes in a small container it looks like vaseline and then you line the edges over here and then you cover and okay so we will repeat that again. You take silicone oil, it looks like vaseline, then you smear, uh, you smear the edges, and then you put your cover. Usually it's very, very sticky, so you find that you always have to, to, to slide it. So here, after I have sealed silicone oil, it creates a very good, nice, tight seal. It reduces loss of vapor, yeah? But if you don't have it, sometimes you can improvise. Then, you can see that the vapor is, 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 is going up the filter paper. You can see it has really slowed down. And the reason why we put the filter paper is to allow saturation all over the tongue. Saturation takes a long time, especially if you are using a large tongue. So typically, just for good results, I leave it to saturate for about three hours. Yeah. But you find that if you are using a small tank like this one, saturation takes place very, very fast. You just pour your mobile face, you can leave it for about five minutes, and saturation will have taken place. Yeah. So for this one, give it a lot of time. So we left this one saturating in the morning. Why do we do saturation? to avoid a problem called tailing. So Raphael, you will explain to the class what is tailing. Thank you so much. So uh, I'll use one which, has already, which is already done to explain, but now uh, uh, I'll use a commercial plate to show it. Yes, is this one good enough? No, not, really. not really. Okay. So, as this is now, if this is our, let's use this one. If this is our plate, if this is the plate that we have spotted, the, the best plate would be this one, one which is not done. So, I'm allowed to destroy this plate, sorry. So, this, this is one of, we, for purposes of demonstration, I'll use this plate. So, this is where, assuming you have spotted here, and here, and here. So now, once the tank is not saturated, when you place it inside the, when you place it inside the tank, you'll find that during development, the mobile face is supposed to move from downwards, upwards, up to somewhere here where you'll have the solvent front. But during this movement, if the tank is not well saturated, you'll find that the, 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 the spotted, the spotted uh, uh, item here will start moving towards the side. It will start curving outside, outside, so it won't move straight. So that is called tailing, okay? So it will form something like this. It will go in the opposite direction, and then it will form something like this. Instead of going 
instead of going straight in a straight manner up to the solvent front. So you end up having bad results. So this is this is called tail. You can yes, yes. so just to repeat what we said, you find that the solvent is supposed to move up to the plate by capillary forces at vertically at 90 degrees. Yeah. But now if the tank is not well saturated, instead of it moving vertically like this at 90 degrees, now it will move at any angle. It can move like this, it can move like that. Yeah? And it will create a bad effect. Imagine if your drug was over here, it will move at this angle and it will even get out of the plate. And you will not be able to measure what we call the RF values accurately. So basically, the take home message is that we saturate the tank to prevent tailing. Yeah. Okay, so now um, Raphael is going to demonstrate. Now, this is our saturated tank. We started saturating these two tanks in the morning. So Raphael is going to demonstrate how to put the tank, the plate, our TLC plate which we have spotted into the tank. Okay. With the assistance of Mr. Molukumbi, uh, bring it. So remember, the tank is usually not moved. So, so it is, you are supposed to slide it. Okay. So with the assistance of Mr. Molukumbi, we are going to use this tank. So you can move slightly ahead. So he will, sli he will slide this one. Maybe so you just slide the tank. You delete like that. And then you put your plate very fast. Yes. Okay. So remember that is done in one motion. You remove very, remember it has silicone. So you remove very fast and then you, in one motion you put the plate. And remember before you put the plate inside the tank, you are supposed to measure the solvent front, which we had already marked somewhere. So uh, the solvent front, like in this case, uh, this is already, so the tank is supposed to develop for quite some, for some time up to a certain level. So this is one of the plates that we have tried to develop. We have already developed it. So the solvent front was here. Okay. So now it means that this line was moving and it ended up reaching this edge here. You, you mark very, use a very tiny marks. So once it is there, you're supposed to remove. So, uh, can, is it okay if we, we, we assume that time is, is already out? I just want to, to re-emphasize what a solvent front is. So the solvent front is the maximum distance that you want your mobile face to move. Yeah? I don't know whether you can see, but um, if you had noticed that, that the solvent will start climbing up the plate. So go and see, tell us whether you can see the solvent is moving up. Can you confirm for us? Yeah, I see some movement. Yeah, you can see some movement, yeah? So you can see some movement, yeah? Then as it is moving, it is now taking material. So think of the ocean, yeah? If you go to Mombasa and you are at the beach, then a wave comes. So the wave is actually the mobile phase, yeah? Then it comes with force. And then it will move any material with it to the shore, yeah? So that is the concept of what is happening, yeah? So the mobile face is moving up the plate vertically, and before you put the plate there, 
which we didn't demonstrate very well. Before you put the plate, we should have shown you that we should have marked the plate with a dot, yeah? Which is the maximum distance that you want the solvent to move, yeah? Mm. So, like, in this, in, this, in this one over here, you can see there is a line right at the top. Can you see there is a line right at the top? A horizontal line? So that is called the solvent front. After they did this analysis, they drew the line. They drew the line. So the solvent front is the maximum distance you want it to move. Typically, on a 20 by 20 plate, anything above 10 centimeters is acceptable. There's no fixed distance, but the longer the distance, the better. So maybe here you are looking at a distance of 15 centimeters from the bottom. Mm. So actually development of the plate is allowing the solvent to, to move. Yeah. Mm. So it takes a long time, especially with these large plates. Initially the movement is very, very fast, but usually even you have to wait for even two hours. Yeah. And since we don't have two hours, we will stop this plate. It has moved about how long? Can you just tell us about how long it has moved? No, it's still just one centimeter. About? One centimeter. One centimeter. It's because, it's because it's preparative. Yeah. It takes time. Yeah, especially a preparative plate takes time. So you can see that we have been talking here for about maybe like three minutes and have only moved one centimeter. It even gets worse. So you find that once you've left it to develop, you leave it for about three hours. So let us assume after it has developed, um, now Rafael will show us what to do after we have reached now the solvent front. Okay. So now the same way uh, we put is the same way you are supposed to remove the plate. So because you can't wait for two hours, we'll just show you how to remove it, okay, and how to dry it so that it can be ready now for the next phase where you, you are supposed to proceed. So uh, I think now, Mr. Molukumbi, you come again. Yeah, I, I, I'll, you, you, you remove it. So once it has reached the solvent front, so, you, so I'll remove, so again, Remove it like that. Okay. That's okay. Sorry, okay. Sorry, sorry. And then it is allowed to dry. You can see even the one centimeter it has moved, there is a progressive movement of the sample. You can see it. Can you see it? Yeah, you can see it. This is where it's spotted, but now the sample is moving progressively upwards. So if it would have reached, assuming this is a solvent front where we have marked with this, this, this mark here, so if this is our solvent front, then that means our line is like this. So we allow it to dry. So uh, I see different people doing like this, but it is not advisable. It is advisable that you just allow it to, 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 to take its time and dry. Thereafter, uh, we, were, we, did, uh, we had done another sample earlier on which you already removed, so here it is. So let's use this one. So now this is the, this is the same sample. It has developed up to this point, okay? The same way, this one has developed up to this point. So now we have this area where development has occurred, yes. which Dr. is saying it's about 15 centimeters, okay? Yes. So now, he, she will explain now what we are supposed to do. Okay. Now, um, okay, now where we spotted, we call it the baseline. So what has happened is that this sample we had, had very, very many compounds. It had very, very many mm. compounds, yeah? So now, 
Can you see any compound? <laughs> Be frank uh, on the plate. Can you see any compound? Yes or no? Yes. <laughs> no, you cannot see. Can you see anything? Yes, yeah, uh, so you cannot see anything. It is white at the yeah, center. So it's like, for example, if I spot paraffin here, can you see paraffin? No, I can't see. No, you cannot see. Mm -mm. Now, the reason I ask that question is I want to introduce a topic known as methods of detection mm. in TLC. Actually, you find that there are compounds here that have been separated, but you cannot see them. So you need to know how to detect the compounds. So we have chemical and spectroscopic methods of detection. So over here we have our UV chamber. I don't know whether it, it's usually very portable. Yes, it is. I can, I can bring it here. Let's put this one here. So there it goes. So a UV chamber is simply um, a chamber. Oh, it's a small room and it, it has been darkened. You can see it's a box, but we have just made sure that everywhere is dark. Yeah? So this is our UV chamber. So what you do is that you take the plate which you have developed and there is space all around. All around so you put it into the chamber yeah and then when you're doing this it's good to have a pencil so please give me that pencil there so that is my pencil so you get always make sure you have your pencil with you and then now you close the opening so what I'm doing over here is that I am closing the opening. To the stick, do not move the yeah. okay. so, so let's let's close from this side. Okay, end. so you close the opening, but because now don't close it completely. Because and if you notice I have not closed it completely. The reason being is that I need some space to insert my hand. Yeah? Although it should be totally dark, but it is not possible. So you find that sometimes it is better to put this machine in a dark room. Yeah? So over here, I put my UV lamp. So unfortunately, I do not have my UV lamp here. But then here, I put my... UV lamp, yeah? Then, the UV lamp, you can now change the setting so that it operates at two different wavelengths, yeah? Mm. So the two different wavelengths are 254 and 365 nanometers. Okay, now I want you to read, to read, to read this. It's silica gel, GF, GF254, GF254. Why have they put 254? It is telling us that if you want to detect compounds, put the UV light at 254. What happens is that when you put the the uv light at 254 the light will be absorbed and the spots will appear as dark spots 
So there's a TLC plate over here. This one. Actually, when you check under, when you check the machine, you will actually see circles. You will see circles. Can you see circles? Yeah? You can see circles, yeah? Now those circles is now where your compound is, where the pure compound is. So, I check, so you find at 254, you will see dark spots. So you put your hand over here, and then you look into the chamber, and then now you draw, you draw the edge of the dark spot. So I want you just to demonstrate how you do it. Put your eyes and then look at the plate. Yes, this way. So that is 254. Yeah. So get a feel of how to use the machine. find unfortunately this method you might miss some compounds yeah but generally it's very very good you can detect all the compound so alternatively you can put it at 365 you can vary you can, it can be either 365 364 or 366 now what happens is what we call fluorescence. Have you seen those motorcycle drivers? Yeah? What, what type of jackets do they wear? Reflector. They wear a reflector jacket. Yeah. During the day, is it shining? No. no. It doesn't shine. What happens at night? It shines. It shines. Yeah? Now I want you to look at the roads in Nairobi. Yeah? If you look at the roads in Nairobi, if you notice at night, what do you see at the on the lanes? There's some lights. Yeah. I don't know, but at the, during the day you can't see you them. You can't see them? So no, at night they are there, you can see. Okay. So, there's a phenomenon known as fluorescence. Yeah? So those compounds, they absorb the UV light. Mm. And then they are emitting what we call fluorescent light. And usually the fluorescent light has different colors. Like the ones that worn by the motorcycle drivers, we have orange and we have yellow. Yeah? So now, at 364, you find that the plate will start emitting fluorescent lights. Yeah? So where you are seeing that light, you also put a circle. So over here, you find that the appearance can be something like this, yeah? The appearance can be something like this. Okay, these ones we had sprayed, but you expect to see such a thing. You can see over here I have three different spots, meaning that in the initial mixture I had three compounds and they have separated. Yeah. So this is what you expect to see under UV light. Great, I hope now you yes. put in that concept. So the advantage of this method is that you don't destroy your compounds. So this is the best method, you don't destroy your compound. But unfortunately, you may not detect everything. So we have what we call the chemical methods of detection. There are very, very many, yeah? Mm -hmm. Now, we will go through the most commonly used. The first one is the iodine chamber. Mm -hmm. okay, so, So, 
ideally, ideally we should be working in a fume hood. We have a fume hood there, but uh, because of, uh, you can see it over there, the fume hood, but because of the purposes of photography, we are not working in the fume hood because we are going to produce fumes that cause a lot of irritation. Yeah? So, we should really be working in the fume hood and I hope you don't get irritated by the fumes. So, this is the iodine chamber. It's very, very simple. It is not, com it is not uh, complicated. So, what can you see at the bottom? Can you see anything? Yes. Tell us what you can see. Iodine. It looks like soil, yeah? Yes. So it's brown, it looks... So you can see brown material that looks like soil. That is basically solid iodine. So you put the iodine over here, that is all. If you want the work to be very good, you just heat your oven at about 100. Then now you put the iodine chamber into the, into the oven for about, not even for long, just for about five to 10 minutes. Then you will see purple fumes filling over here. You can see this is stained with iodine, yeah? So you'll see purplish fumes. That is evaporated iodine. Then now, because of irritation, this method is very, very irritating. So you get, I prefer working with a forceps, but we don't have a forceps or even a sellotape. If you don't have a forcep, you can use masking tape. You can use masking tape. Yeah. So this one has masking tape or labels. Yeah. Okay. So you can take labels, but labels are more expensive. Then you attach to the back of the plate. This is to avoid your fingers coming directly in contact with the fumes. Yeah. So what you do is that is that now you sorry. Is that now you put is that now because of irritation you just hold the tip and then now you put your plate into the iodine chamber and you close yeah yeah so you put your plate so i'll just turn it so that you can see that the tip is hanging outside So the tape is hanging outside. The reason why we put the tape is so that it helps us to suspend. It helps us. It helps us to suspend the 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 plate in the iodine tank. Okay, here we haven't quite. Um, the iodine is not well saturated, so you leave it for long. But I I don't know whether you're able to see this one. Can you see? dark spots yes yeah can you see dark spots many many dots yes. yeah and dark spots some of the spots are brown some are yellow and some are green so what happens is if a compound has a double bond it will absorb iodine and it will make the compound turn color yeah so now you find that 
these pots are the different chemical components that were in the mixture. I don't know that the audience will be able to see. Then you get a pencil and then now you draw the spot. Yeah? So iodine is used to detect compounds that have a double bond. Yeah? You can see it's a simple, easy method to use. So the other one that we can have the other method for detection, so when we are sure that this is ready and done, yeah, you can even see some darkening of the spots. Yeah, you can even see what has happened. Yeah, so iodine creates brown, yellow, or greenish spots. Yeah, then you put a circle around the spot. So uh, please go with the iodine. Okay. The other method for detection is called a universal detector. Because you find like the problem with fluorescence is that not all compounds will fluoresce. So the universal detector is Mwalukumbi tell us. Is one percent vanilla in acid. So let me repeat what he said. The other detection reagent is 1% vanillin in sulfuric acid. It is here, yeah? Now, here you have to be extremely cautious. I'll repeat again, be cautious. Sulfuric acid can burn. If I want to finish you, I can finish you with sulfuric acid. If you have to use this reagent, you have to be relaxed and in the fume hood, yeah? Don't expose yourself unnecessarily. Avoid spillage, cause, cause you can burn yourself. So when you're working, anytime you're working with sulfuric acid, be cautious, yeah? You, it's better to be paranoid than to be Sorry, yeah? So usually, for the sake of this practical, we are not going to use it because we don't want to cause havoc, yeah? So you put it in the spray gun. So a spray gun, this is actually a modified apparatus. You can see, yeah? It's a modified apparatus that can allow you to spray a chemical onto the TLC plate, yeah? But um, I'm a bit reluctant to use, he seems I, I, to be... I, I just want to pour it there so that... Can we just it. pour a tap water? <laughs> 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 because I don't want to, yeah, somebody's child, so mm. I don't want to create havoc. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we'll just demonstrate with distilled water. Cold flask. Then this allows you to create a spray so we can assume here we have our vanillin with sulfuric acid. Then now you put now the, this device will enable us to create a nice spray. <laughs> so you can imagine if we had vanillin sulfuric acid. So now you take now your, your plate, sorry, you take your plate and then you put it against uh, Let's get this one. <clears throat> uh, 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 so you, you you put it in the fume hood, then you put it standing against preferably another chromatographic tank, then you cover part of the plate with another glass plate. So just bring, okay. I will cover a small section, not all of it, yeah? Because you find I don't want to spray everywhere, especially if I'm doing preparative chromatography. Because the problem with sulfuric acid, it is destructive, 
it causes this structure yeah so i cover most of the plate yeah with another plate this one you only do it when you're doing preparative tlc so you can see I have covered the plate with another glass plate. The part that I want to recover. So all I simply do is that um, you simply just spray. Yeah? Because of water. So this is how you'd spray. Please demonstrate. So, so this is the part that is covered. And then there's a, a small part which has been left. So this is the part that we spray. So this is the spray that is because this is water, there is no harm. So just spray like this so that every like that. so that half of it is sprayed. Okay. So um so basically in summary you put you put you have one percent valinin in sulfuric acid and you spray on the TLC plate. This is an analytics plate. I don't have to recover anything. So I can just spray the whole plate indiscriminately. Yeah. Okay. So this is our spray gun apparatus. So after you have sprayed, you can imagine if I've sprayed this plate or that plate your oven has been on at at least 100 degrees you put the sprayed plate into the oven so you put it into the oven what will happen you find that sulfuric acid it has a charring effect meaning that it burns yeah it burns the compounds and then now they appear as either most of the time, brown spots. Some compounds actually become colored, yeah? Like eugenol, it usually takes a purple color, yeah? So this is what we expect to see. Yeah? So once you spray it, you expect this one to turn pup to, to be to, to, to be purplish. Then this is the place which is circled, and this also is circled, and this is a, a sample of a drug which which already developed. So maybe Prof, you can explain what's happening here. Okay. So. But we didn't explain the scraping off. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's explain. Okay. Now. Okay. Over here, uh, in this particular instance, um, this E stands for eugenol, which is our positive control. Yeah, and then um, C over here. Um, okay, then so here we have C, and this is clove oil. Yeah. And then S here is our sample. This was actually an analytic plate. This was an analytic plate, yeah? Now, you find these three dots, if you notice, they are at the same level. They are at the same level. They moved the same distance, yeah? They moved the same distance. That, tells, that is one of the signs that eugenol is present in clove oil and it was also present in our sample because they moved at the same level. So this is an analytic plate. Yeah? Then um, the next thing that you do next, okay, you find that in our preparative plate, the reason why we put the glass plate in front is to 
avoid to avoid the sample being destroyed by by vanillin sulfuric acid but what will happen the part that we sprayed you will be able to see that this is the thickness of my sample this is the thickness of my this is this particular area like the equivalent part over here this is where my eugenol is yeah so that will tell you that at this particular point is where my eugenol is in this case maybe it could even be an organophosphate so you mark that so you mark the particular area where your eugenol is yeah then you draw a thin line now i want to recover eugenol from my sample i know that eugenol is located somewhere over here yeah so you get a spatula do you have a beaker yeah so you get a spatula okay or you can even get a petri dish then this is a prep you only do this for preparative column chromatography okay yes. let me just use this one okay. yeah so now you simply scrape off the silica gel this silica gel has the drug of interest yeah and make sure you don't go beyond these lines so so this is actually recovered silica gel and if i want now to get the drug of interest i take methanol methanol is a very very good solvent just put a little not much and put it on the powder okay so the drug which i'm interested in will get dissolved in the methanol then i can either centrifuge it is actually better to centrifuge it's better to centrifuge but if you can't centrifuge you get you can actually filter out so here we are going to filter yeah so in this way i have recovered the drug of interest yeah so the advantage is that now i have gotten from the patient's abdominal content i have gotten now um i've gotten um i've gotten i've gotten now a very very concentrated sample of the patient's the patient's some yeah so the last thing i want to tell you about is what we call the rf 
value. Yeah. So the RF value, you get it. It is used to document. It is, it is the RF. So this is actually the sample that I have recovered. I can now even subject it to more tests. Yeah. Like for example, HPL, HPLC chromatography. Now, to recap, now I want to tell you about the RF value. Imagine that this is your solvent front, yeah? Mm, and this is your baseline. Your baseline is where you spotted. So you take your ruler, you take your ruler, and then you measure the distance from You take, you measure the distance from the baseline to the solvent front. In this case, it is 16 centimeters, yeah? Then I come approximately to the center of this spot. Okay, so please come and tell me the distance from the baseline to approximately the center of this spot. 10.2. 10.2, yeah? So I divide, okay, so the RF value is the distance moved by the, by the spot divided by the solvent front. In this case, it is 10.2 divided by 16. So when you're documenting, you say that the RF value was was um, was in this case it's about maybe it's about 0.75 yeah so you have to document that yeah so if two spots have the same rf value then they are related yeah so um like now i'll give you an assignment each of you i want you to calculate the rf values of each of these spots. This is the solvent front and then this is the yes. baseline. So you can see this one moved a very short distance so it has a very small RF value. So different spots move at different speeds. Yeah. So last but not least if you want to document your results you can either scan you can take a photograph or you can use tracing paper. So like here, this is a tracing paper. You put your tracing paper over the plate and then now you trace the findings. And this is how you have a permanent record. This one we took a scanned copy of what we had visualized and this is a tracing. So with that, we have come to the end of our practical. Yeah. And are there any questions? Maybe I'll just ask one thing. Yes. Uh, how, how, how do you determine uh, the solvent front to choose for each individual sample that you'll be analyzing? Uh, the solvent front, you don't have that one. The only you can choose any value, but at least the solvent should have covered about seventy-five percent of the plate. If it is a very large plate, like if it's a very large one like this, if you say it should go right to the end, you'll spend the whole day. So you have to counterbalance between time and 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 the distance move. But you can use any. You can use any value, yeah. But you find with this one, when you're even making the slurry, even you don't even need to, to do all these steps. You just dip the microscope slide into the slurry. You let it dry. Like this one. Yeah. So if, well, like when I'm making this one, this is called a microscope. This one, I, I can even let it move right to the end. Yeah. So when I'm making when I'm making the slurry for a microscope slide, so you put two against each other. 
And then now you dip very, very fast. Usually the slurry you make it in methanol and uh, or chloroform. And then now you remove them from each other. This one was in water, so the binding wasn't very good. And then now you allow it to dry. You find it dries very, very fast. Even you don't activate. And then you find that this one, it will develop even within five minutes. Mm. Yeah. So that one, this one, when I'm using a microscope slide, I just allow it, to, even I can allow it to go until here. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So there's no fixed rule, but at least let it move at least 75% of the plate. One thing I forgot to mention is that for some drugs, we have highly selective detection reagents. Like if you're suspecting the patient has taken morphine, we have a detection reagent for morphine. If you're suspecting the patient has taken organophosphates, we use alcoholic silver nitrate. Yeah. So we find for some drugs, we have specific detection reagents. Now, thank you for your question. Do you have any other question? You don't have any question? So I think with those few remarks, I wish to thank all my assistants, and we have come to the end of the practical. Thank you.